Hello, I'm Carl Wells. My guest today is one of Newfoundland and Labrador's foremost visual artists. He's a master printmaker, and much of his work is based on his indigenous ancestry. His name is Jerry Evans, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the program, Jerry. Thank you, Carl. Um, I want to talk to you about your ancestry, first of all. Uh, how old were you when, when you when you found out that you had these indigenous roots? Oh, from a very early age. Uh, I mean, I was living in, in uh, Windsor and Grand Falls. Uh, we moved before we moved before I entered grade one, and we uh, we moved to Cornerbrook at the time. But I knew previous previously to that because uh, I remember asking my grandfather, you know, why we get called these names, and that you know I have cousins who were. You know, straighter hair, darker skin, and so on. And uh, he told me, you know, why. Told me the story, and and uh, you know, th that was that. I mean, we always knew, but nobody really spoke about it, you know. And uh, it wasn't until it was in my twenties that uh, my uh, grandfather's brother, uh, Uncle Cale, came home from uh, my great uncle came home from Ontario, and uh, myself and Dad were going moose hunting out in Central, and we were living here in St. John's at the time, and. During that trip, he told me uh, the story of, of our, of our, uh, of his mother, my great grandmother, and um, that, uh, at the time, that kind of, you know, I, I sat with that for 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 some time, and uh, but I think that was the the kind of turning point that gave me license to, uh, to uh, and and the, the desire to find out more about uh, that part of our ancestry that nobody really spoke about, and uh, you know, it's been a journey ever since, really. So when, when you initially found out, was this news exciting to you? Uh, how, did, how did it make you feel? That's a good question. Um, how did it make me feel? Curious, I guess, more than anything else. Mm. You know, to want to know more about something that, you know, a lot of people in my family weren't willing to talk about, you know, because you know, I, I began to ask questions and I didn't get a lot of answers, but I kept asking so, questions so and so on. Why were they unwilling to share this information with fellow family members? Well, I mean, my story is is mirrored by you know a lot of uh, similar uh, stories in 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 this place. This is, uh, we call Gadamguk in our language, place across the waves here in Newfoundland. Uh, you know, uh, before um, uh, joining Canada in 1949, you know, the, the indigenous people of this province. Uh, lived on the periphery of white society, you know, in places like Windsor or Glenwood, uh, isolated communities like Con River and Flat Bay, and and uh, just to eke out a living, you know, in in uh, uh, in, in white society, basically, or, or you know, to work on in the periphery of of, of that uh, uh, colonialist uh, situation to fit in, to make a living, mm -hmm. to feed our families, and uh, in doing so, a lot of people. Uh, um, uh, hid their ancestry, you know, to fit in, stop speaking the language, to fit in, speaking in you know, the colonial language. Uh, in some cases, uh, in a lot of cases, I guess over a period of time, not being, uh, uh, you know, a, a tight-knit community, but kind of spreading out to eke out, uh, uh, you know, a lot of cultural uh, aspects of lang and you know, including language were, were lost. and. Uh, and in doing so, you know, if you lose your language, uh, a lot of that culture disappears too. And uh, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, our story is, is, is uh, very similar to, well, you know, probably 80% of, of the indigenous population here, you know, have that same story. I remember when I was in school, we learned nothing about the indigenous no. Newfoundlanders. We, no. we learned about the Beothic, yeah. uh, obviously. Uh, but that that was all we knew. Mm -hmm. uh, we we knew, had no idea about uh, the fact that uh, there had been indigenous people uh, living in Newfoundland, were still living in Newfoundland, had been here for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, it was just it was just, and I to be honest, I don't think there's much taught in schools today. It's. Somewhat, it's a little better, but uh, not much. I mean, um, we were taught that, uh, you know, well, I was taught the same thing you were taught, very little. And, uh, and, we, and, and those instilled uh, myths uh, that the, uh, um, you know, those, those colonialists, those British uh, myths were instilled, you know, that, uh, you know, the Mi'kmaq were brought here by the French 
to kill the Biathic, which was English propaganda against the French. Total enemies, propaganda. Right? Total. Right? Total yeah. propaganda. And, uh, yep. you know, uh, uh, we've been here since time immemorial, you know, and the Biathic, uh, the Bidagawa, and, you know, in our language, uh, our people up the river, I mean, we're all Algonquin-speaking peoples, mm -hmm. and uh, we're probably related. I mean, really, come on, you know. Oh, first. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that, like, uh, uh, well, to, for instance, uh, you know, uh, you look at the uh, uh, white colonialist fishing communities, the airports there in Newfoundland, you know, you go, you go from one community to the next. If they're static in, in each place, uh, there, you know, there were dialectic language differences, you know, from one community to the next. And uh, that was probably the case with uh, the Mi'kmaq and, and, uh, and the, and the Biathic. I mean, there's lots of factors where, you know, in, in uh, 1765, when the French were forced out of, uh, of Acadia, you know, and the, the, the Mi'kmaq were Catholicized at that time, and the, the priests were forced out of the, uh, Nova Scotia, to what was uh, at the time the French Shore of Newfoundland, and a lot of indigenous people from Nova Scotia came with uh, uh, the priests in that to, to Newfoundland, right? And uh, and with the other French people who were their allies, uh, and you know to to eke out a living here too, you know, alongside their allies, the French. Eventually, the French were forced off the uh, the uh, off. Uh, well, uh, Newfoundland to what is now St. Pierre Miquelon, and there's you know just there's ties there with uh, the Mi'kmaq community. So, so h how far along have you gotten in your journey of discovery about your roots? I mean, uh, have you found out everything you you need to know now, or is there still thing that are there still things you're exploring? I'll be exploring until I pass. I think. I mean, you know, this is a, a, a lifelong journey for me, and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been trying to learn my language for, for many years, and without immersion, I don't think that'll, that'll be possible, you know. My wife, Eileen uh, Joe, who's from uh, Con River, grew up there, and she doesn't speak her language either, you know. Uh, but um, there are, uh, you know, there are attempts to, you know, uh, to teach the language in, in Con River and, uh, and in uh, other areas. Uh, the Flat Bay now, I believe, teaches it uh, through the Halibu, uh First Nation, and um, but I think that without you know immersion, uh, it's probably not going to mm -hmm. you know take root, mm -hmm. solid root. You know, it'll, it'll be you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a, you know that revitalization in in, the, in, in trying to uh, recapture the language because you know as I said earlier there, you know, there's so much in the language, mm -hmm. you know that that speaks to to. Uh, who we are as indigenous people. Right? So you've, you've really embraced your indigenous roots in your art. You attend uh, the powwows and other events that uh, are held. Um, and you've, you've made your own regalia um, from moccasins to headdress. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk about that. How did you, how did you go about uh, make, because these are, it seems to me they're works of art in themselves. How did, how did you uh, learn how to do that and find out what it was you needed to, to make? I think it all stems from, from that, you know, early want that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, to find answers, you know, that being curious and uh, that curiosity brought me to, you know, uh, not just uh, this, this place where I'm living now in St. John's, I'll live here now for a little bit more, but you know, I, I, I ventured out, I, uh, you know, I went back home to Grand Falls, Windsor, you know, to talk to extended family there, to ask them questions, look at photographs, to hear their stories, if, they've ha if they had any. But, you know, I also ended up uh, through my practice, uh, you know, doing some work on the West Coast with, with Halibu First Nation or, or the Federation of Land Indians back in those days, you know, over 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I started going, I visited Con River back in the day and and, uh, and I guess Con River became my go-to place. You know, I spent every, every chance I, you know, that, that I could get, you know, I would, uh, if I knew I had a, a weekend or a week off or, you know, uh, outside of my work at the time, I would uh, pack up and I would uh, head to Con River. And I would stay with, uh, 
Mizel Joe at his house, and we would sit around with uh, him and his brothers and other people from the community, and we'd be talking about language. I'd, I'd ask questions. They'd be asking questions, too. You know, they'd be learning language. I'd be learning language, and, and uh, it just became a uh, regular thing for me. And, I don't know, and uh, you know, there was, uh, God, this is, like, well, we finally had our, our 25th uh, Maui Omi powwow in, uh, this year in, in Calm River after COVID. But prior to that, uh, I went with uh, Misel Joe, his wife, Kalida, and a, and a few others to Eskasoni to attend my first power with them. And, uh, and that was kind of, uh, you know, uh, a new thing and, and uh, eye-opening and kind of gobsmacking at the same time. And, and, uh, and just watching people dance and, in, you know, people who have the same ancestry as I did and... and uh, you know, just celebrating who they were as indigenous people, and and not long after, a year or two later, we started having our powwows here at, at our Maui homes in in, in Con River, and uh, I uh, I've only missed one, and um, but uh, just you know, just by attending there and, and talking to people, people from uh, people from all the parts of Mingamagi came uh, to our powwows. Our people from here went to their powwows. There's a powwow circuit that happens practically all, all summer long in, in this part of, of Canada, but there's Maui Omis and powwows happen all over North, North America all year long, right? And uh, that's what some people do in, in, in their, you know, we have traditional powwows, there's uh, competition powwows, but uh, I, I'm just by being there, you learn from people, you're talking, you know, again, asking questions, you're watching people move, you learn about the dances, you learn about the songs, how, you know, how the drum works, how the drummers drum, and, and how songs are, are constructed, and what types of songs are for for women, for men, for this type of dance or that type of dance, and I mean, you can't help but uh, get out there and you know mm. strut your stuff and swing its way to Mi'kmaq way. And uh, then I started to build my own regalia, and uh, and uh, I mean, for me, I, I consider my regalia a, a like a living thing. It's it's evolving, you know. It's it's uh, something that's uh, added to or every time I uh, you know throughout the year, you know, I work on my regalia or somebody gifts you something or you gift some something to somebody else and you do a trade you know for for certain regalia parts or or you learn something about a different part you know and, and you you add to it and and so on you were born in uh grand falls mm -hmm. um but you spent m several of your growing up years uh in mount pearl went to school in mount pearl uh when did, did that art spark Hit you? When did when did that interest develop in you? My father got trans, uh, transferred because he worked with the provincial government uh, when, we, when I was young, and uh, he got transferred many times. And uh, we, I think I, I think I figured it out that we moved like six, no, seven or eight times before I reached high school, different areas of the province. And wow. We curling Cornerbrook, Curling Cornerbrook, back to Grand Falls, Windsor. St. John's, Mount Pearl, St. You know, and and uh, and having you know switching schools all the time. It was my sisters a year younger than me. You know, we used to spend a lot of time together. And and but you know, you'd get to one place, you'd make friends, and you're uprooted and you have to move somewhere else and try to make new friends. But in those little pockets of time, you know, I used to spend time, you know, with comics like you know, like any kid, uh, you know, and, and drawing and 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 you know, my dad drew a little bit. He was uh, quite talented too. He he he. Uh, there was every kind of instrument in our house, from you know harmonica to accordion, guitar, acoustic and electric, and keyboards, which I haven't got a clue how to play any of. <laughs> but uh, uh, he also had drawing books and that, and uh, you know, with calligraphy and, and so on. And I found myself, you know, thumbing through these types of books, and uh, which there weren't many of, but. Uh, you know, I, I just drew a lot when I was young, and um, it wasn't until I got to high school, really, uh, where it kind of blossomed, I guess, under, under the tutelage of uh, Robin Cook, who was my art teacher at uh, Mount Pearl Central High in, uh, in the late 70s. Yeah. He, he was your high school art teacher yep. and became something of a, of a mentor, I guess, for you. Most definitely. I guess, you know, he recognized my uh, abilities, I guess, but... Luckily for me, uh, I mean, uh, that school had, uh, I think somebody told me it was like a, a dree school. I can't, I, can't, I, don't, I can't explain that. But they had, you know, they had, there was a kiln there. They had soapstone. They had easels and paint. And uh, there may have been a printing press. 
Oh, very well but, equipped. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. for a high school in, in yeah. the in the in the mid to late seventies, yeah. and uh, lucky, you know. And uh, you know, I, I spoke to him. He was, you know, wasn't just my teacher. I, I kind of got close, and you know, I used to talk to him about about stuff and everything, you know. And and uh, but it was he who, you know, kind of. Uh, I should mention probably like uh, by the time I got to high school, I was tired of uh, doing all the moving around and and social life became very important to me and I let my grades slip, you know. And uh, I had some problems in high school, but uh, Robin Cook was always there. He was a good mm -hmm. shoulder to, to lean on, and I I spoke to him in that. But uh, make a long story short, um, probably uh, six or seven years later after I graduated from there. I was back there substituting oh, as a teacher, <laughs> and there's still some of the teachers that taught me still there, which was kind of <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing here? That would have been kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. But I, I left high school. I did a, a year of commercial art at uh, the College of Trades and Technology, and then I uh, was still uh, wanting more. And I, I, of course, I talked to Robin and uh, Mr. Cook, and I, uh, and I ended up applying to go to NASCAD. Mm -hmm. Instead of actually, I didn't even know about West Viking College on the West Coast at the time, but I went right right to right to NASCAD. Yeah. And, and NASCAD is the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Right. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering if if I were to look at a, a look at something you'd created, you know, when you were 20 or whatever, mm -hmm. what what would I see? I well, you kind of you kind of asked me that question a little bit, a little bit ago. Um, my work, I guess, has always been about who I am and where I'm from. I mean, even the early work in, the, you know, before I went to NASCAD or work while I was at NASCAD uh, was about who I was and where I was from. It was about being from Newfoundland. I, you know, I painted fish, I drew fish. I, you know, I, I, my dad was a diver. I did a little bit of diving, and you know, I did, did work about that. I, um, and it was around that time that. Uh, we hooked up with my great uncle, mm -hmm. and King's kind of, you know, after hearing the story and and sitting with that, and and uh, just kind of started, you know, just kind of open up a, a gate, I guess, or door, and I started to explore that through my art practice as well, you know, doing research um, into Mi'kmaq culture and. You know, learning things about our basketry or our porcupine quill work and, and uh, applique, traditional clothing, uh, the petroglyphs and Kijimukujik and, and all of that, all that material culture, all that cultural sacred uh, markings and, and so on. And, uh, you know, learning about language and, and um, but, you know, having tangible things as well, you know, mm -hmm. and spending time in Con River, uh, finishing art school. Um, and uh, then I did an education degree at Memorial, where I did my electives in, in ethno history and, and provincial history, you know, with the province and that, and learning about the indigenous cultures here, taught by white men in, at the university, and, and kind of navigating around that and and uh, and um, questioning things, you know, and learning more from both sides and questioning lot, lots of things and kind of exploring that through, through my art practice. And, mm. yeah. um, so it's always been about who I am and where I'm from, basically, mm. in a nutshell. Before, uh, before we run out of time, I want you to tell one story which I thought was kind of, uh, kind of nice. Uh, it's, it's about uh, Gerald Squires oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. you're meeting Jerry yep. and then showing up at his mm -hmm. Lighthouse mm -hmm. studio in mm -hmm. Fairyland. Tell that story. Well, uh, I mean, after I graduated from NASCAD, I started spending lots of time at St. Michael's because I didn't have the uh, uh, to wear with all. I, I couldn't afford to rent a studio space. But luckily for me, St. Michael's was there that had a studio space and the facilities. And St. Michael's Print Shop. St. Michael's Print Shop, sorry. And um, <clears throat> by being there, I, uh, you know, I got to meet artists over the years. And uh, But prior to that, even in high school, when I... I used to, uh, you know, uh, uh, I forget the name of the gallery on Duckworth Street, uh, Ernie. Uh, Moskov. Yes, I used to visit there, and it was a small gallery down at the Murray premises mm -hmm. there for a short period of time, and I was there one time for an opening. I was still in high school, 
And uh, I met Jerry Squires, you know, I, I introduced myself, right? Hi, you know, I know who you are and I like what you do. And, and he said, oh yeah, that's nice, you know. And he was living at the, at the Fairland Lighthouse with mm -hmm. Gail and the kids at the time. And, uh, and he said, you should come visit me, bring some of your artwork, basically. And, and well, I said, wow, you know, that was, that was incredible, you know. And, I was still in high school, and I took a, and I, I and I, and I wanted to do that, right? And you know, I, I wanted to get his opinion on my artwork, you know, other than Robin Cook and so on. But you know, I uh, packed up my, I had a, a junker at the time. I was, I was driving, and uh, it was a miserable day. The day I decided to go to Fairland, I took time from school, put some of the work I had, drawings and that, and uh, maybe a painting or two, put it in my car and I drove to Fairland and by the time I got down there it was blowing the gale, not on like the, the hurricane weather we've had just recently with Earl and uh, I get there, I'd never been down there before but uh, you know you can see where the lighthouse is despite the weather and I headed that way and you get out there there's this little isthmus mm. towards where the, the peninsula is where the yeah. lighthouse is and I I mean, it was raining like this and like this, and it was, the rain was blowing, and I get to the other side, and I get stuck in the mud, and I don't know how I'm going to get back. I managed to turn around afterwards, but uh, I parked. It was pouring rain, and I walked into the lighthouse. It was a good walk, and yep. uh, I get in there, and, you know, the wind and the rain, and I'm soaking wet, and I knock on the door, no answer. <laughs> Oh no, you know, I'm all this way. It probably took me an hour to drive there, probably an hour to get in there. And there's nobody there. And uh, it's like, so I knocked harder and still no, no answer. And uh, I walked around the lighthouse and there was a window. And I looked, in, I stopped and I looked in the window. And I peered in the window. I must have stayed there until, I don't know, time seemed like it stood still. But I stood there and I peered into the window and I saw for the first time in there the studio. Mm. You know, the easel, the canvases, you know, paintings finished, paintings unfinished, you know, work in progress, brushes, you know, paints everywhere, the palette, you know, and just, I was gobsmacked. I just stood there, you know, probably my job might have been hanging open, you know, and uh, I kind of, you know, in retrospect, uh, not long after, you know, I, I got exactly what I wanted to get. Mm. Uh, by going there, you know, but he he wasn't even in, even there. But it was it was actually several years later when I told him that story. Right? He and Gail and uh, yeah, that was um, that was uh, quite today. I mean, I still picture it clearly in my uh, in my mind mm. right now. Uh, Saint Michael's Print Shop has has been very important in your life. Most definitely. Uh, just talk about that relationship. Well, I mean, it was there you for... You and St. Yeah, Michael's. Yeah, well, Bill Ritchie was there when I... And uh, Peter Walker was there when I started poking around. I think f they had just moved from the community of St. Michael's to St. John's, luckily for me, because I didn't have a car at that time. And uh, But I managed to get there to work as a, as a, as a community artist because, you know, it's a not-for-profit and they have the facilities there. You pay a nominal shop rental to use their equipment and so on. And... Uh, as I did, and it became my studio, and I worked there whenever I could. You know, I still had to get a job and pay for my student loans and so on. And um, but I've I've spent many years there over the years. Uh, same way, it's still in the same place. Some most of the same equipment is still there, and uh, there's I've watched stones get broken and disappear. The stones I worked on in stone lithography mostly, and uh, but. Uh, I worked there in many capacities. I was, I was uh, uh, first, first and foremost, I worked there as an artist, as a visual artist, to make my, to do my own practice, lithography, etching, and so on. And uh, but then I, over the years, uh, managed to. I worked there for a time as a technician, took care of the shop, you know, the chemistries and everything, topped everything up, helped uh, other young artists uh, in their practice, and uh, I did some teaching and. We already had a visiting artist program. You learn something from from visitors. You, you learn from them, and uh, because you know it's a co-op. And uh, but I, having worked there with other artists for many years, it was uh, like people like uh, it was Anne Meredith Barry mostly, but uh, Otis Tomasowskis from Queens University, and uh, Don Holman used to come from Ontario annually, and uh, they recognized my abilities as a printmaker, and. Uh, 
they suggested that I design my own chop. What does that mean? A chop is a, uh, it's, it's, a it's a stamp and embossing, uh, which kind of, in, in the custom print world, uh, you know, as a, as a producer of, of art or prints, uh, and it's kind of a production process where I would prepare a, a matrix, a stone, or a plate with another artist. They would hire me, basically, to help them create their work. So I, I would prepare their matrix, they would make their marks, I would work with them to show them how to make marks even, or you know, then we would mix colors to, to proof the image so that they can get what they want in the end. And when they, when they see what they want or are happy with what they have, I would run the addition for them. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, you know, at the end they would number their prints, they would sign it their name, they would title it. St. Michael's has its chop, which is a puffin head, that's their logo. Mm. So that would be embossed in, in the print. But if I printed it, I would put my embossing there. So I'd get recognition for the work that I put into producing mm -hmm. this image for, you know, for this artist. Mm. So you know, it was another way for me to get uh, 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 to supplement my income, you know, working with other artists and uh, working for the shop. I, I brought money to the shop as well you know, as, as a custom printer. So people came, um, not just uh, community artists, Work with me, and I worked with just about every artist here at the time, with Jerry Squires and Barry, uh, quite a bit. I made books with Ann Barry and everything, and and, and uh, Scott Gowdy, um, Helen Parsons Shepherd, and there was artists who came from other parts of Canada to work with me, and uh, a couple of international artists who came to work with me at St. Michael's. And mm. Jerry's been great having this chat with you. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, thank you for You're being very here. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Jerry Evans, Master Printmaker. And that's it for this edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. We'll see you again next time.